Do I have a motion? I'll move. Moved by Mike. No second. Second by Chris. Additions, corrections, comments. All in favor? Uh -huh. Aye. Opposed? Best. We'll move right into public comments. Anyone? Nothing? Okay, I guess we'll be, since Randy's away, uh, oh we'll be skipping the highway and the building reports, and we'll go right into old business. The uh, first thing I had in the old business was uh, last year we had a meeting right here in this room about the black bear issues in the village and in the town. It happened to be a real dry year. A lot of bears were in the in the area and there were some issues. We had DEC came and did a, a report and uh, <coughs> suggested some things that we should do. Uh, since then we've been in touch with the chamber office with Donna and uh, I, I think we're going to try to piggyback the, the uh, Bear and Wine Fest and try to raise some funds to help uh, um, purchase some canisters for down through town, bear proof, animal proof canisters. Um, if anybody's up real early in the morning and travels through town, um, the bears kind of made, made a serious mess on a daily basis, so I'm going to try to raise some money that way. I'm sure in future reports we'll be hearing more of it from Donna's uh, or the chamber. Uh, next thing I had was a vulnerable population registry. It's out. Anybody knows anybody, they feel uh, it should fill one of these out and submit it. Uh, feel free to take some. Uh, we haven't posted, or if they're not posted already, they will be posted around town in some key locations so everybody can uh, have access to that. Also under old business, something that just happened today, we just finally got the contract signed with GAVAC for um, the uh, fly car. Um, actually, Harry and Lake Pleasant signed the contract. We're waiting on the wells at this time, but um, if that happens, probably um, late today or tomorrow, we, ex we should expect to see the fly car around town on, on Monday, starting on Monday. Anybody else have anything under old business? I have. What are bear proof canisters? Yeah. Uh, they're well similar to like the uh, um, the uh, trash thing that was at the town barn last year. You have to special handle to. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's so it's not not accessible, easy for for an animal or people. Yeah. <laughs> Can they pick yeah. it up and take it away? <laughs> Well, that's the thing. Part of the cost of this would be that a slab is going to have to be poured and they'd have to be anchored to the slab. So, so they wouldn't be as big as the thing that was at the town hall, the dumpster. No, no, they're... Uh, Thanks, can I interject? Rather than waiting for public comment at the end, only because I did a lot of research on them because we have allocated money in our village budget this year for bear-proof canisters. And when I was looking at the company that we probably will buy them from, there, there you have two options. You have the one option that kind of looks like a dumpster, which is really kind of ugly. And it, they're made for municipalities who have the dumpster facility for the dumping, you know, like in the cities when they come and they dump the dumpsters that way. And the other type looks more like a... a mm, like a mailbox, so to speak, that you see out west some yep. someplace. Um, those, the majority of them, however, came with wheels on them, <laughs> which isn't a very good idea because <laughs> it could be just wheeled away. <laughs> so when Roger and I went over this, we thought, and the price is cost prohibitive for the canister type. Number one, they're really not very attractive looking, and secondly, they're very cost prohibitive. There were certainly within, not within what we had allocated in our budget for. It. So, going with the other ones, which, which Roger and I had probably decided on doing, we could probably afford to get two of them. They'll take the wheels off of them and anchor them some way That's to right. the ground so that um, the men would be able to put a liner inside. Because if you can't put a liner inside, 
whoever's picking up that garbage does not want to take out your rotten hot dogs by hand. Right. So it has to be something that a liner can be put in. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're looking at these things that um, it's hard to find attractive ones. I know when we travel out west, sometimes I'll have the mailbox looking ones and some very talented people will draw on them and you know do something that's indigenous to the area insofar as a pine tree or something cutesy on it and that kind of dresses them up but your options are very limited in getting nice looking usable bare fruit containers and they are expensive they, they range they, in they price have, in especially the ones that look like dumpsters yeah. and again that poses a whole problem with lighting them and with emptying them. Right. But the ones with the wheels on, if the wheels can be cut off and anchored to the ground, then the bear can't, or anybody else, can't wheel it away. Yeah. You know, the one that, that, that I believe that you're talking about, the wheels were an option. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. um, thank you, Karen. Uh, we'll move right into uh, new business. Uh, first thing I had was uh, the uh, computer upgrades, and uh, I had to ask Brian, uh, he's one was a week or so ago, Bob, when we spoke about it. Yeah. And uh, Brian sent me some information. I thought it's best to have him come in and explain it, uh, what he was proposing here. Brian? Um, I'm Brian McIntosh, Canada Lake Computer Services. Um, I've done work for towns and businesses all over the area. I handle about uh, 500 uh, computers that I service and maintain on a regular basis. Um, one of the things that comes up, that I, and when I started noticing this, I started telling people that they've got to do something about it. Windows 7, um, uh, support for Windows 7 will end in January of 2020. Um, and what this means is that no more patches will be provided for that. So when a, a bug occurs that allows a, a, an exploit, Windows, Microsoft is not going to patch that. So you leave your systems open to, to uh, exploit. Um, so I recommend that you move up to Windows 10. Uh, that brings up the question is how old are the computers? And the computers, you start looking at those, and once they're in the five-year range, you really need to replace the computers also. So rather than just upgrading from Windows 7 to Windows 10, you're better off just going ahead and going to Windows 10 on a new computer. Um, it's, really, it's, it's more cost-effective, you're going to have a better machine to work with um, across the board. Uh, so anything that's prior to a Windows 7 or Windows 7 or prior should be gone, and actually I recommend anything that's even got a Windows 8 on it, get it over onto Windows 10. Uh, it's, it's just the, the way to go. So that, that kind of started matters out. We started looking at that and I provided some information about that. Um, I provided a quote for systems to replace that. And the systems that I recommend to replace with are, um, these are five-year warranty systems. Um, they have uh, solid-state hard drives in them. Uh, the reason is, is because it's what makes them run faster than anything else on the market. There's no way you can make one right now. That's the fastest way to get them on. So rather than spend uh, money on faster processors, which you won't use in your environment, I spend it on faster hard drives or solid state drives. So the, the price is about the same. I can put faster processors in, but you won't even be able to tell that. Uh, the solid state hard drives for the money is, is where you want to put your money towards. So. Um, looking at the machines, the, the, I put 250 gigabyte drives in them. That should be sufficient without any real problems to cover your needs on, on all the machines. So the, the space, space requirements are fine. Um, there's a couple of options here I put in here. Uh, one of the things uh, that I have is uh, antivirus. Right now you've got it on a couple of machines. You've got ESET on a couple of machines. We can upgrade that to a municipal package. Um, that's not listed on here because I have to quote it separately. Um, but a municipal package, I think it's like $24 a machine for two years or something like that on the municipal package. Um, that's what it comes down to. But you do have to buy five licenses to start with. Okay. So it has to go on five license, minimum of five license pack. Um, it's the antivirus that I recommend and use across the board. Um, it is, 
less obtrusive than a lot of other ones. It doesn't jump up and yell at you all the time. Don't go, well, let's buy this or, you know, increase your uh, coverage or anything. It really just covers what you need and it doesn't go anymore. Uh, a couple options on monitors. Your monitors are in pretty good shape. Uh, I basically replace monitors when they need to be replaced. I don't usually recommend getting them off the time. Um, office, uh, home and business, uh, 2019. There's, there's a, a, a difference between Office 2019 and Office 365, and it's a pricing thing. Office 365 is a subscription package where you pay every year or every month for that subscription. Uh, Office 2019 is a license package where you buy the license and it's yours for as long as you have that machine. So when I look at the buyout on it, it's about two and a half years. If you pay for a subscription, you can pay for two and a half years on a subscription, which will pay for the license of a machine. So if you're going to keep the machine for five years, you're better off buying the license. So um, it, 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 there's a couple other things involved in it. These are basically with the assumption that you're going to use the package on one computer per person. So one person is using that one computer. If you start using that on multiple computers, like, like I do, I have on multiple computers, then the Office 365 starts making more sense. But in your case where you've got one computer, one person sitting in front of it, one license, it's the way to do it. So, and always, if there's any questions on the options or anything, give me a shout. The next thing that comes up is backup. Um, there is no comprehensive backup in the town. Uh, there are two machines, the York, Danny, and, and uh, uh, Kathy's are backed up. Um, those are backed up to the cloud. It's not a real efficient backup to the cloud because we're back. We're using the internet to back up all the data to the cloud that, that, that's needed to be backed up. It's not the best way to do it. The best way to do it is to have a device in the building so everything gets backed up to that device and then take the critical data and send that to the cloud. So we don't have to back it all up to the cloud, just really the critical data. And when I say critical data, it's the data that's really important. If the building's missing, <laughs> we need that data. Uh, you know, there, there's some things that you don't have to worry about, but it, that, that's the real difference. So the device I recommend is, is the Satara Cloud Storage Gateway. Um, I've got probably mm, 60 of these out there uh, working. Um, what it does is there's, it has two hard drives in the machine that are mirrored, so there's a copy on either one, which protects you from a mechanical failure there in the building. So if something happens, so you've got it on your computer, it backs up all your computers to this device during the night, during the evening, and then later on in the evening, it takes the critical information and sends it out to the cloud. So we only have one device talking to the cloud rather than all the devices. And we've got a local storage for quick retrieval if we need something. Um, one of the situations we had with this um, a couple of years ago, it gives it a really good protection against things like um, the, um, no, the, I'm trying to think of what they call it, <laughs> uh, ransomware, where they encrypt your data. And I had a, a customer, we put this in in like June, and in August they had an email came in that came into two computers, and they both got encrypted in, in the course of a matter of a couple of hours, those machines were encrypted, um, just from, from the people opening the email. Uh, when that happens, there's really no way out of it other than to pay their, their ransom to, to, get that, to get that back, with the exception of really good backups. So what we did is we, they, they called us, we went down, grabbed the machines, we wiped them clean so that we made sure that there was nothing left behind from the ransomware, and we restored their backups, and in 24 hours they were back to where they were that morning. So they, they really had everything without any loss at all. So that's why I kind of recommend this type of situation. Even if we just go to a cloud story, the time it takes to pull out all that information back down from the cloud is much more difficult than having something right on site. So it makes it a very easy way to take care of it. Um, there's a little bit of cost up front on it. Um, uh, I estimate the cost at uh, uh, $1,602 for the first year cost, and then $295 uh, per year for the cloud storage uh, annual fees. Right now you're paying, because the because we actually have two workstations that are connected, that's actually what you're paying for those two workstations right now. So you're paying $295 just, just to the two workstations. We can put this in place 
with a one-time fee, and then from then on, it's the $250. Now, again, remember that this will need to be replaced down the line, five, six years, that we have to update that and, and bring it uh, back up to, to the bar, check the media to make sure we're using the proper media at that time. But uh, it is a it is a like a five-year cost uh, figure. So, um, and then the other thing that I, I gave you a sheet to tell, tell us all about this, uh, but that's very detailed. If you want to get into real details, I can go into it farther. But about the encryption, any data that goes out is already is already encrypted. Um, you don't have to worry about anybody getting their hands on it. Um, I, I have the encryption key. The uh, Sotera has the encryption key, and you have the encryption key. Um, and you won't even be able to find the encryption key. So, you know, it, 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 it's kind of automatic, and you don't have to do anything to do back. It just machines are assigned, it's backed up. It tells me if they're not. So I can administrate it and fix anything that isn't backed up. Um, the only other thing that I can add is, uh, is that the more and more I am doing um, managed services, which prevents me from having to drive up here to fix things. Um, I have several different levels of that, and right now I think it's a little expensive for the town to get into that. So I don't think I would, I would recommend that. I think if, if we were seeing where you needed me to come on a more frequent basis, then we might look at that. But right now, in the last two years, I looked up to see what I had charged you for uh, support calls in the last two years, and I had charged you two hours time. So, that's the, I, I, even though I come up and spend some time once in a while, most of the time you'll get charged for it because it's part of, part of something else that I'm doing. Yeah. So, and if you've got any questions, I'd be glad to talk to you anytime. All right. Okay. All right, thanks, Brian. Yep. I never would have been explained. I never been explained for reason, so I appreciate you coming up. And... No problem. Yeah. Any questions, Paul? Don't hesitate to ask. Okay. The so managed you. services is something where you come periodically and look no, at. No, managed everything. services is something where I actually put a tool on your computer, and I can make sure that all your Windows updates are done, make sure that your antivirus is up to date, working properly, make sure that, that any patchings are being done. I can manage to see if you're. You're, I have alarms that I put on there to sell if you're running out of disk space. So it, before you even know that you're having a problem, I usually know about it. So you're monitoring them remotely? I'm remote monitoring your systems all the time, 24 hours a day. Okay. So that's what managed services are. Okay. And that, and that gets in the, into the cost of, you know, like $25 a computer per month. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's kind of, it, it can become a little pricey, especially with my history of what I've seen so far. Not that you're right up to date and shouldn't have some more more services, your machine should be updated, but uh, I, I think it's a little pricey for what you need right now, uh, even though even though I'm really selling it and pushing it to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ask good. you a question. Yep. Nothing personal. Do you have access to the data, any of our data, any of the town's data with that, cap there, with that capability? Yeah. Yes and no. Okay, so yes, I do have access to the entire, to the entire system if I, if I have that. That is a, again, it's an encrypted link that I have between the two machines, so that it can't go anywhere else. So yes, I do have that access to that, but one of the things that I don't do um, is that I, I normally don't have the passwords for the individual software packages, like the accounting software. I would not necessarily have a password for that. I might, I might not. I do some reports, some of that stuff, um, but um, I've been at this for 35 years. And part of what I, part of the reason that I have such a nice customer base is, is that they all trust me and I can, you can talk to any one of my customers, I don't care which one it is, whether they're a current customer or a past customer and they'll all give you the same story and somebody you can trust them to not share information between things. But I actually deal with insurance companies or insurance agencies that are in competition with each other and they know this and they know that I see all their stuff. And they know that they, I'm not going to share that. I don't share what happens in one with one of the other ones. It's just not done. So that's that's the type of, of uh, customer base I have. Um, I've worked with banks. I've worked with uh, I, uh, I worked with the Patriot Federal Bank, and before Kinderhook took it over, um, never required any bond for me or anything uh, to to work, and I had access to all their information. So. It was, in fact, I still have keys to the bank. And I, I also send out to the board, um, Peter Newell also sent us a, um, an estimate and some ideas of what he's suggesting too, and I did send that out to the board the other day. So 
Um, Peter would be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any later after the meeting also. <clears throat> All right, do you want to give a presentation to uh, Peter? I wasn't really prepared to give a presentation. Um, I, you all have seen what was sent out, I'm sure, mm -hmm. and not having advanced knowledge of all the details of, of what the town has, it, I wouldn't have details uh, like Brian has. Um, but I've been doing this for 20 years, and uh, I have a lot of uh, small networks such as yours, and I'm well aware that cost is always a factor, so um, we would have to discuss the details of what you're, you know, really looking for. Uh, if you needed, uh, if you needed that, so I don't have the cost for individual machines or what we need to replace or not because I don't have that inventory. Um, and uh, you know, I don't know the details of what which ones are being backed up and which ones aren't, and all that. But um, I made some suggestions, which if we want to discuss that in detail. Uh, at some other time, we could do that. Very good. Thank you. Well, the only thing I'll say is, you know, if I was smart, I would have just bit the bullet and moved back here 20 years ago. <laughs> but I'm here a lot of the time, so in terms of, you know, stopping in and looking at things, mm -hmm. I'm five minutes away, usually. Uh, and my philosophy is that we do what we need to do so that there aren't any emergencies. If there are, um, if it's a hardware failure, obviously it's a hardware failure. If it's a, if it's a frontier problem, nobody's going to remote into anything. Mm -hmm. So that's likely is not to be the problem. Uh, but if it's a software issue on a particular machine, uh, remote access can be done if I don't happen to be here. It's always a lot easier if you just sit in front of it. Always a lot easier because uh, if you have to reboot or, you know, if the internet connection happens to be slow today, you the remote is not always great. Sometimes it's wonderful and sometimes not. Mm -hmm. Do we have an inventory of the computers? Seems like maybe it should be something to get done. Mm -hmm. Who would do that? I'm sorry, Who that? would do an inventory of the computers? Huh? Just anybody could go in and write down model numbers and stuff like that, or does it take any particular expertise? Just better go through looking at what you got. But you would look at each machine, you would look at the hardware, you'd look at the software, you'd look at the version of Windows, uh, you'd look at what applications are running on that and are they up to date uh, and and uh, so I wouldn't say anybody can do it you kind of have to know a little bit about getting into the computer and looking at some things my main concern also is availability of a technician to be there when needed because at times we had to wait a long time, Brian, I well, know. Well, the, 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 with that, my, I'm a small operation, there's no mm -hmm. doubt about it. And, uh, you know, if it's an emergency, usually you get moved to the top of the list. If it's something that's not an emergency, it will wait until I'm up in the area again. That's, that's usually the case. Um, but uh, an emergency is always at the top of the list. I'm, I'm the IT guy for a lot of businesses, and they all have to share me. So. Are, are you you work on your own now? Yes, I do have one fellow that's work works for me part time, but he's only part time right now. He's he's got another job and he only comes in part time. So oh. can't can't afford. He's, he's working for Knowles Atomic. I can't afford to compete with their ways. Okay, yeah, I think we should. Take till the next meeting to work these over and uh, oh, make a decision yeah. and how to proceed. So, thank you both sure. here and Brian. Yeah. I appreciate you coming in and reporting yeah. to us. So, yeah.
We'll move on to um, the Adirondack Speculator Region Chamber of Commerce quarterly report. Donna? May I sit? Can I do it for my chair? Sure, you can. Thank you feel better that way? I do. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just want to preface this by stating that the numbers and stats that we hear tonight are, I guarantee, are underestimated because the agreement between the town and the chamber was not signed until January 22nd. And at that point, we started tracking the things that you'll hear about. Okay? Uh, as far as mailings, approximately 150 mailings were sent from January 1st to March 31st. This includes requests for information, applications for the farmers and crafters market for the summer, and applications for the Bear and Wine Festival scheduled for October. Approximately 250 phone calls were received during the first quarter. Our email accounts received over 700 emails, that doesn't include junk or spam, and we sent out almost 500 emails from January 1st to March 31st. As far as the website, during the first quarter, the Chamber's website had an excess of 2,500 users, of which 2,241 were new users. Total web sessions exceeded 3,100 and the average session duration was 1 minute 50 seconds. The most popular page was the events page with over 1,300 views. As far as Facebook is concerned, as of March 31st, our Facebook page had 7,138 followers. That's not likes, that's followers. And on December 31st, 2018, we had 6,928, which means we gained over 200 followers in the first quarter of 2019. We posted 130 times from January 1st to March 31st, and we received and answered over 20 messages via Facebook. And in terms of Instagram, we currently have just over 1,000 followers. In terms of advertising, during the first quarter, we placed two ads with the Helmut County Express, specifically for snowmobiling in our region, for a cost of $87. Almost 4,000 copies of our snowmobile map were distributed throughout the area, and we entered into an agreement with WYVS and started advertising events, the Chamber, and the region. In terms of economic development, we've been in contact with and working with Christy Wilt and Rochelle Martz from the Hamilton County uh, Department of Economic Development and Tourism and Hamilton County IDA. They have been chosen to be the Adirondack North Country Association's Center for Businesses in Transitions Liaison. And we've been working together to identify businesses and, individu and individuals who would benefit from ANCA's CBIT program in our region. We've also secured a representative from that program to be the guest speaker at the Chamber's annual dinner in May. In terms of attending roost meetings, I attended the quarterly meeting with our roost representatives where all regions of Hamilton County came together to discuss the summer and events throughout the county. We're also developing a county-wide cross-promotional uh, concepts that would enhance the visitors' experience to our region and the county. This past quarter events included promoting all the winter activities and events in our area. We designed and created a Facebook campaign for the Chamber's 2020 calendar. If anybody saw those pictures. Did a lot of preparation for the summer events. And we assisted the Historical Society, the Fourth of July Parade Committee, and the Lions Club with the second annual Maple Fest. For events for the next quarter, we're organizing Community Pride Day and a great Adirondack garage sale for our region and also scheduled is the Chamber's annual member dinner and the Farmers and Crafters Market will start in June. Any questions? Yeah, could we get that? Can line? we get a copy of that? <laughs> <laughs> can, you send that can you send that to me by yeah. email and then I'll send it out to the board members tomorrow? Thank you. Okay, that'll thanks, you yeah, that'll yeah. work. Thank you. Very, very, very complete. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? <coughs> no? Thank you, Don. Um, any other new business? Anyone? I was in Latham today at a sexual harassment class. <laughs> so, which was two well, 8.30 to 11.30. And um, the whole presentation is going to be sent to us by computer so everybody can sit in on sometime in the future so that we can definitely be qualified and sign off on it. Okay. And I have posters 
that will go into every building for everybody who has taken the class. Or have already taken that. Yeah, so yeah. we need to educate. You know, now we've signed off that we've given them the booklets. Now we have to sign off that they've taken the course. So, and it has to be taken every, given every year. So maybe between the two of us, we could. I got it. You can do it online. Yeah. Well, they suggested that we bring it to them into as a group because they want questions and answers. They want they want everybody to interact on with conversation, not just watching it on the video. So. Exciting. All right. I can do it here. Bills. Do you have a motion to pay the bills? Anyone? I move. Moved by Nancy. Second. Second by Mike. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And we're back to public comments. Anyone? Hearing nothing, round table debt. No. Nope. Nancy? No. Chris? Uh, just that if anybody's interested, the next late budget emergency plan will be Tuesday, April 30th, starting at 1, I believe, at the county office building. I did want to bring something up, Dan, yeah. if you feel we haven't. The, the, the problem with cell phone coverage. And I think I sent out an email about sitting at mom and dad's looking out the window one day and all of a sudden, duh, look at the smokestack, you know, on the school. Make a great place, I think, for uh, uh, antennas for cell phone coverage. And they were always looking for existing structure rather than putting up towers. And started, you know, just thinking along this whole cell phone problem. I talked to a couple people up in Inlet because they were successful in getting a grant for the town to build a tower. Now, I wasn't thinking about the town building a tower, but what really interested me about what they did is they did a postcard campaign a few years back when they decided that they were going to do this. And I don't know what it costs. I'm um, looking into that, what they paid for it. But what they did was they had all these postcards made up and they enlisted the businesses to help them get them passed out. And they were passed out like all summer long to make sure all the people who, not just the um, people who have second homes here, but people who were traveling through, people who were staying at the campsites, they got thousands of people to return these postcards to Verizon and AT&T and I can't remember the third one. So, and it, sprint. it worked, it was a sprint. Yeah. And they got their attention. And they got their promise that if they put up the tower, they would put on antenna. So I'm just wondering if um, that might, I know we don't have anything in the budget for something like that, and I don't know yet what it would cost, but I'm thinking that that might be something that we could look into and see if, get started on trying to push them to at least get the antennas up on the, the tower at the county building, which to my knowledge, they still haven't said they're going to do that. I believe that's... It's in the works? Yeah. Oh, good. Good. In fact, I think this coming week, they're supposed to do some work on the tower, and I'm not sure what that includes. But, yeah. Will they be in with the tower, the tower people company. or the phone company people? I, I think in preparation for the phone Oh, okay. Wonderful. I hope so. Yeah, that'd be great. And I'll speak to John Frey and see if I can get some information on how they did that. And see okay. if you can email a copy of you too on that. Yeah, so okay, that'd be great. Postcards aren't as expensive as actual mailings. Right. Yeah. And I guess it was easy for people to sign their name and throw it back in the mail, you know? I mean, yeah. Well, the, that letter writing campaign, I mean, they're still calling me yeah. with <laughs> over... Uh, you know, the Public Service Commission, mm -hmm. so that kind of woke things up a little bit, yep. but not enough, unfortunately. Well, we've got some change. We just got to keep nagging. <laughs> How's that? The North Country Economic Development Council meeting is, was it Thursday? Or Friday of last week? Thursday. And, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on... Uh, the cell tower problems throughout the Adirondack Park. In fact, the new co-chair 
Dr. Tai, I can't remember her last name right now, actually made a comment that she was actually scared driving from Ponce Dam to Lake Placid without cell care, cell coverage. So, it's she's always from, in that Georgia. part of the world, though, yeah, that they yeah. get the action. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, of course, uh, Betty Widow and a few other people were there, and uh, they made comments about the problem being that uh, uh, the cell tower height. So I did a little checking into that because they said it was not approvable to have over 80 foot high towers. Well, none of the applications that come in for towers over 80 foot. So it's been suggested that uh, uh, the cell companies start applying for towers over 80 foot for variance. Mm -hmm. So, but that has, doesn't seem to have been the problem. The problem is that they're just not applying for cell towers. Yeah, they don't want to bother. How did they do that ugly tower on Blue Mountain? That was pre-existing, most of that I believe yeah, wasn't was it? It's been there like forever. That thing hanging off the side of the mountain? Yeah. It's been there as long as I can remember. towers and, yeah. and uh, um, I'm not uh, really involved in detail, but I am because of our uh, county uh, uh, radio races um, and uh, uh, it's very tightly controlled, but it's a pre-existing tower and, you know, you get in there with, you know, Homeland Security and all this good stuff. Um, so that's, that's blue, but you really have a problem. Uh, so are you, does somebody propose towers in some other, I mean, yeah, obviously Oak Mountain's the best place you can possibly put anything, and they thought there's also, there's already... There, yeah. You know, but it, we have mountains and we have shadowing and things like that, so... Well, the thing is, if we can get them high enough so that they can see each other, then it works, right? Mm -hmm. The microwave transmissions? Um, if you do that's microwaves, that's... That's, that's, that's so line of sight and the beams are so narrow that if a bird flies between them, that's part, part of the problem with microwaves. That's but the, problem now. the question <laughs> is, the question is, where, you know, what's the problem we're trying to solve? In other words, you know, there's coverage out to, I can't do it at my house. I can do it if I go out to the lake, mm -hmm. but I can't do it in the house. It's not reliable. Right. So, where would be a location or locations that would fill that in? And, you know, the cost of putting the equipment up, forget about the permits and all that, you know, to, to, cut, to cover, you know, a few holes here and there. It, it's really hard to justify unless you get a grant somehow, you know. But don't forget too that the technology is changing too. The new 5G technology, they're, they're experimenting now with the antennas on the top of streetlights as long as they're 500 foot apart to cover the uh, last right areas. So you could do that and that would they daisy chain that, whatever. But you got to have 5G technology though. Um, yes. And you can do microcells and you can do it. I know an inlet that's what they did. And of course, they've got the tower project. But years ago, and I know some of the guys that have been involved in doing their, doing that stuff, uh, you know, and they just had a local microcell on top of the, you know, building in town, and you had cell coverage locally. So. And you don't need to have line of sight between them. No, I think they basically had a internet-based. Um, link and you could only have like 20 people and it was not a full-blown cell mm -hmm. uh, where okay. you had you know, All right, I see what you're saying it's like somebody pulling up out back here and right. getting on the uh, the Wi-Fi well, it, wi it, was, it, was it was an antenna that was on the top of um, the you know screen and eagle yeah. basically mm -hmm. I think that's where it was and so people in town could use their cell phones uh, it was not a full site, so I don't know what the capacity of a, a full site is, but maybe 500 users. Mm -hmm. They had like 30 because they were limited by, they were basically doing voice over IP on the internet. Yeah. Just yeah. like you can get, mm -hmm. 
uh, if you spend some money, uh, you know, Verizon will give you a, a micro cell for your house. Of course, it costs you. you know. There you go, Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I need somebody like you that knows something about this stuff, at least a lot more than I do, because I'm willing to spend time <coughs> looking into this. I know Dan is. He's been pushing it on the county level. Right. But the problem is with somebody like me, I don't know the right questions to ask, and I don't know who to go to to talk to them about it. Yeah. So could I come and pick your brain someday? Sure. Okay. I mean, I don't know any of the details of Verizon or AT&T or what they have and what they said they'll do, what they won't do. It's no, I, any I understand I think that. a lot of the uh, problem is they don't want to spend the money because they don't think there's enough people. No, right. And there isn't. There's no return on investment for them. Right. Mm -hmm. Very effective because they come mailed from other places. And those are customers that they very much value more than they do value the Ooh, possible point. customers mm -hmm. we have here. Well, yeah. They, work. yeah. I mean, I've done work for people in you know, around Fourth Lake and stuff that that uh, um, have a lot of money, you know. I mean, they had a big construction business or something somewhere, and they just like, I want this, you know. So, I guess you'd have to see, uh, one of the things is, all right, what exactly are we trying to accomplish? Do we want, you know, everybody covered? How do we do it? Do we do it with the, with the you know, Things on the on the on the, uh, the you know, on the power poles. How many of those would we have to have? Where where are we lacking coverage? How far out you want to go? Yeah, that's the kind of thing I'd like to sit down uh, and talk to you about. Be nice now, if we could get the, the places surrounding that come towns to mind, involved. Yeah. To me, are two places that come to mind, but I think the better of the two is if you could get them to do. Um, a tower, you know, cell site um, at the Pasigo School. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. when we do the, now we're at totally That's different frequencies, a lot lower, but when we do the, the radio for the triathlon, mm -hmm. and we usually do that on simplex on purpose, we don't use the repeater. And that's a pretty good spot that people can, you know, hear around the lake. Mm -hmm. And of course, it would come back this way too. Mm -hmm. So if you get out of the coverage of, oh, because you're behind a hill or whatever, and we know that happens when you go out Route Eight, you lose it. Yeah. You know, maybe that's a spot. And it's not like it's on top of a mountain somewhere where you have to jump through a lot of hoops and run power up there and all and that. Build a road. Mm -hmm. Build a road. Yeah. Uh, that's just a spot that comes to mind. Um, you said there are two spots that you would suggest? Well, we usually have our net control at the, at the airport, and um, actually the coverage from there is you know, out towards Pasico. It's mm -hmm. really not back this way all right. that great. In fact, it's, we know cell coverage is tough, and, and we can get into the repeater, but that's the top of Oak Mountain. Well, that would be more a problem for Arietta. Although mm -hmm. Nancy just made a good point. If we got into it with Arietta, now we're in a shared services situation where grant money is more easily available. Mm -hmm. well, well, and you also, also just have to think of it well, isn't necessarily so Arietta. It's, it's propagation. Okay. I mean, if, if the terrain is such that that cell site is accessible better from, you know, Oxbow Lake or wherever, we get the benefit of that, even if physically it's not located in the town. Right, right, mm -hmm. yeah. But you know, years ago, I don't know, this is probably private, and you you, you could never get it. You'd have, it'd be an expensive proposition. But I remember back, uh, and I don't know if it would get us anything, because it basically looks down Lake Pleasant, but... And I just had the name of the place on my top of my head there. Of I remember I used to ride up there on a snowmobile in like 1972 was Lookout Mountain, which is at the end of Lake Pleasant. I don't know if that's now state land, if that's private. At this end of Lake Pleasant? The other Far end. end, yeah. It's up behind the bells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, behind the bells. Indian Head, you mean? No, the Lookout yeah. Mountain. That's, is that, that's in terms of paper. Is That's it, at Hamilton Lake's property. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, at least we're ahead of the game because it's not state land. Not really. It's lost international paper. <laughs> yeah, no, but I'm saying if it, yeah. if it was forest preserve 
Forget it. Uh, just so, Indian head, that's another possibility, but that's state land. That's you know, most of that's state land. Yeah. Uh, that's not a bad spot, but I've been to the top of that. Put it on my and that's owned by IP uh, Outlook Mountain, yeah, it's up there. But that used to be open to the public years and years ago, if I'm not mistaken. People could climb that, but not anymore. What's that? Outlook Mountain. I don't think there was ever really a trail. I think at one time there was a tower. There was but, well, something yeah, up there. Yeah. And I used to kind of sneak up there. And, oh, you know, where the old there. fire tower was. No. I, Not that hill? That's Hamilton Mountain. You're yeah. Thinking, the fire tower. Oh, there used to be an old antenna up there. Yeah. The, town, the county used it. Is it Chartreuse Lake that's on the top of that hill? I, I don't thought. know, but I know the fire department had, I forget whether it was a... A repeater up there. It's something a long time ago, ago, but I, yeah. because you know, we had the access at one time and we yeah. used a jeep yeah. with a winch to get up there. So yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't really easy. No, it wasn't, but that was you know, that's a fun ride up there. I don't know if it gets you anything that you don't already have. Is the coverage around Lake Pleasant bad? I suspect no. I suspect any, any camper on Lake Pleasant has got more or less line of sight. I think it's more or less like. Page Street on out, on out Route 8 toward the Pasito. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right my house, I can get a text inside my house. I have to go out on the porch to send yeah. a text. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Matt can see the tower from I his house, but yeah, yeah, I mean, he drops you want one on the top of Fish time. Mountain, maybe. Looking back this way, you know. Um, or, you know, maybe Page Street, maybe that's where you got to go to the Ooh, what about the top of the water tank? The water tank. That's one place that they've been putting up the antennas around the park is on top of water tanks. Yeah. Where's the water tank? Now, I mean, I we've got oaks, so would that be like a duplication of effort? Yeah. It's, yeah, okay. If, if, it's there's a sh if it's shadowed, maybe not. Sometimes the lower location is actually better because, you know, the top of the mountain does this, and so you, you've got a shadow. Mm hmm But... There's it's there's programs that will just you know you say I'm going to put this uh, top this antenna here it's got so much power so much gain it's this frequency it looks at the top, topographic you know it looks at the data and it predicts the coverage okay. and I, yeah I'm sure that that if Verizon or AT and T were cooperative they could do that real real easy yeah I'm sure they could and um, I know guys that could probably do that if we We'd have to make some guesses, but you Okay, well, that sounds like exactly the kind of information and people that I'd like to talk to. Yeah. You know, and if we could get something, mm -hmm. kind of get an idea together of which direction we can head, we could start working on it as a group. You know. Now, what does anybody know? Well, we don't know the status of Melody Lodge, but there's a tower there. It might be like anybody would look at that and say, there's no way, I'm, you know, it's too old, it hasn't been maintained, there's no way we're going up there, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But, and again, you would think that would be redundant to Oak Mountain, but maybe not. It would depend on this projection. I mean, that you like put. for Page Street, maybe, maybe Page Street is just not in the shadow of Oak at the... 900 megahertz and the, the, the cell frequencies mm -hmm. we don't have any problem with radio with them you know as far as i know but, in, but that's 150 megahertz mm -hmm. totally different thing peter the, the tower on oak is that a 360 transmission i don't know i was back in brister brook hatchery area yeah on the back side of oak yeah five bars Holy like, cow. You know, <laughs> I don't get that anywhere. Yeah, but I mean, you're only a mile away from it. I mean, well, I, so I didn't know why. Maybe they have that. a face and in so the way. So even if it wasn't, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I get two bars. <laughs> I haven't been up there in a while to look to see if they've got a full array of antennas. Um, it would surprise me if they didn't put any on the back side because there's no people there. They don't think that there's snowmobilers and hikers. Or 
Melody one of them was a TV type. Five bar, but I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah. I don't think there's any radio stuff on the Melody one. I thought Melody one was used with the sheriff. Tower. Was not the sheriff's um, office at one point in time that used that tower? It was given over to the sheriff's yeah. office. Right. PBS. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. TV yeah. tower. Yep. Yeah. That we never got sure, at our house. Really <laughs> yeah, we had ours up there for a while. Our, our, uh, and radio repeaters up there. Well, I'll be in touch. It, Thank you, Peter. It's just, I mean, it's, you know, and it, it's an existing tower. Would it meet the structural requirements? Um, they might just say what's well, just too close to the other one. Do we have the old fire tower or something? <laughs> <laughs> Behind the fire house is the right here. Okay. All right. Do we have any reason to go into the executive session? Mm -hmm. No. Hearing none, I'll no. entertain for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Chris? I'll second. I'll second. Sigma Nancy. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <coughs>